that didn't happen. So that was kind of the first thing that went wrong. Uh, then they took me into the OR and um, put me on the, the operating room table. And uh, I remember them, you know, putting a mask on my face and doing all the, the usual prep work that they do in the OR. And uh, the anesthesiologist told me to take a deep breath and I was out. And so the next thing I remember is waking up and hearing the sounds in the OR, everything was, you know, the banging, the clanging and the monitors beeping and all that stuff. And I thought, oh, right on, it's, it's over, it's good, it's done. And uh, now I can relax, I don't need to feel nervous anymore. And then I heard the surgeon speak and what he said haunts me to this day. I um, was lying there listening and of course, like I said, thinking everything was over when I heard him say the words, scalpel, please. Great. Thanks, Donna. Uh, and welcome. Yeah. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me and share your story. Um, oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. And I like to start my conversations because my wee brain can only do so much and I, it works better when I understand things in chronological order. So I, okay. I want to go back and just sort of get a sense of where you grew up, what your childhood was like, that sort of thing. Okay. I, I grew up on a small t uh, farm just outside of uh, Eltona, a couple of miles actually from where I'm living right now, about eight miles away. I uh, had a very normal childhood. I'm the middle child of three, um, an older brother and a younger sister. Um, grew up with the typical farm animals, the, you know, the cows, the dogs, the cats, and the hogs, and all the good stuff, and uh, yeah, I had a very happy childhood. Um, my parents raised us to be responsible, honest, and hardworking adults. Uh, they instilled good, um, um, what would I, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Values? Yes, good values and, and qualities in us, and uh, I think they did a pretty good job raising us. When I look at uh, some families today and stuff like that, they did a good job. We we had a very, very happy childhood. Yeah, I, only when I was a much older adult did I really come to appreciate uh, good parenting. Yes, yes. Oh, lucky yes. to have the parents I had. Yes, uh, me too, for sure. So you mentioned the town. I'd never heard of it. Altona? Where is that? It is, uh, if you know where Winnipeg is located, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if you do or not, but uh, in Manitoba, uh, Altona is basically an hour south. We are about five miles away from the international border. So we're pretty much straight south of Winnipeg. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And so today we're chatting about your experience with the healthcare system. Yes. Uh, so sort of lead us into that, that story. Okay. Um, a number of years ago, I was having a lot of abdominal pain. And so I went to uh, my emergency room here in, uh, here in town to see, you know, check it out and find out what was going on. And so they, they weren't sure. They kept me there for like 24 hours, and then they sent me to another facility to have uh, laparoscopy done, which is like exploratory surgery. And that is where everything went wrong. So we, we arrived there, and uh, I was feeling kind of anxious, which is, I think, normal for anybody that's going to go undergo surgery. I've had surgeries before, had general anesthesias before, or anesthetics, and never had a problem. But um, for some reason, I was feeling really, really anxious this time. And I asked the nurse if I could have some pre-op medication to help calm me. And she immediately refused. And she said, nope, there's not enough time for that. There was no discussing it, no negotiating, anything. And uh, it actually turned out to be like an hour before they finally took me to the OR, which would have been plenty of time to order some medication and uh, have it start taking effect. But that didn't happen. So that was kind of the first thing that went wrong. Uh, then they took me into the OR and um, put me on the, the operating room table. And uh, I remember them, you know, putting a mask on my face and doing all the, the usual prep work that they do in the OR. 
and uh, the anesthesiologist told me to take a deep breath and I was out. And so the next thing I remember is waking up and hearing the sounds in the OR, everything was, you know, the banging, the clanging and the monitors beeping and all that stuff. And I thought, oh, right on, it's, it's over, it's good, it's done. And uh, now I can relax, I don't need to feel nervous anymore. And then I heard the surgeon speak and what he said haunts me to this day. I um, was lying there listening and of course, like I said, thinking everything was over when I heard him say the words, scalpel, please. And I thought, no way, no, 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 no. I'm, I must have, mis must have misunderstood because this, this can't be happening. And sure enough, two seconds later, I felt him make the first incision. And I can't describe the feeling I had. It, words fail me every time I try. I, the sheer pain, the excruciating pain of feeling him make an incision like that was, was just beyond description pretty much. And so I thought, well, you know, I need to tell him, I need to alert them, you know, I'm, I'm awake, I'm, I'm feeling this. And so I tried to scream, but I, I couldn't open my mouth. I, and then I thought, well, I'm going to sit up, I'm going to try and, and, you know, do something and I couldn't move. And so it, I realized fairly quickly that I was paralyzed, which is often the case when they do abdominal surgeries, they give you a paralytic and that's to relax the abdominal muscles so that they can operate. And the anesthetic had not taken, but the paralytic certainly did. And so I figured, well, <laughs> I got to scream, I got to move, I got to do something, but uh, I, I couldn't do a thing. I could not do a thing. And so I could hear my heart rate on the monitor and it was just, it went from a relaxed rate of, I don't know, probably would have been what, 60 or something like that when you're, you're in that state to like 147, I think it was when the surgeon told me later when he had looked up at one point, it was 147. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so I went into immediate panic mode because I, I was trapped in my body, so to speak. And I, but I couldn't do anything. And so I, with my heart rate up and I feeling so scared and panicky and everything, all this stuff is happening like almost instantaneously. And I couldn't, do anything about it and so i could hear my heart rate on the monitor and as it was going faster and faster and faster i needed to breathe faster but i couldn't take a breath and so it took me a few seconds to realize that i was intubated and that the ventilator was breathing for me but and problems, for folks who aren't familiar with that term intubated what does that mean they had a tube in my throat and i was hooked up to a machine that was helping me breathe because when you're paralyzed, you can't breathe on your own. Everything is paralyzed. And so the ventilator was breathing for me, but with a really high heart rate like I had, I needed to take more breaths than I was getting. And I found out later that the ventilator was set to give me like seven breaths a minute, but I wasn't getting that what I needed because my heart rate was so high. So it's like when you're jogging or something like that and you know, your, your, your breathing increases as you're, you're um, working your muscles <coughs> and stuff, but I didn't get that. So to me, it felt like I was suffocating because my heart rate was high and yet I couldn't get the, the amount of oxygen that I was, my body was craving and needing. Yeah, hypoxia. Yeah. And so this, this continued. And uh, so at the same time, you know, when my heart rate started to go up, I heard the surgeon speak. And he said, she's in distress. She's in distress because he could hear my heart rate on the monitor as well. And he, uh, he then called the anesthesiologist by name and he says, what's wrong? What's wrong? And uh, then, then I heard the nurse speak up and she says, oh, he's not here. And I'm lying there thinking, what? And she says, yep, yeah, he's not here. 
And the surgeon is quiet for a second and he says, where is he? And she says, I don't know. And so I'm panicking still thinking like, where is this guy? He's supposed to be sitting next to me at my, you know, next to my head and, and watching my monitors and that kind of thing. But he wasn't even in the operating room. And so then the surgeon told the nurse, uh, you go find him now. And then I heard the doors of the OR open and close, like they, they have a, a squeak to them or whatever. And so I heard her leave the OR. And after what felt like a very long time, I, I, I have no sense of how long it really was, but to me, it felt like an eternity. He came back and I, I sort of felt his presence. I felt him sitting down next to me. And I thought, okay, now he's, he's going to notice that I'm in trouble here. He's going to, you know, notice that I'm awake and he's going to give me something and I'm going to go back to sleep and I'm not going to feel any more of this pain. Unfortunately, that did not happen. He did give me something in the IV. I, I could feel it. The IV was on my arm rather than my hand. They couldn't get it into my hand, so they had put it up a little higher. And so I felt him put something in my IV. I don't know what it was, but it did not make me go back to sleep. And so the surgery continued. And so for the next 90 minutes, I lay there while they inserted uh, instruments into my abdomen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Looked around and I remember the things the the surgeon said he as he explored you know he said oh your ovaries look really good her um uh her appendix is nice and pink and healthy that looks good you know colon looks good i could hear all this stuff going on i could hear everything he said and the whole time i have this excruciating pain as he's pushing my organs around and examining them and you know digging around in there and then all of a sudden I heard him say you know oh there's lots of blood in here this is not good and so I'm still in panic mode the entire time listening to all this and thinking why are you not noticing that I'm in trouble here and um, it went on for an hour and a half and I, I didn't think I was going to live through it the, the pain was so bad that I, I honestly thought I was going to die. And so what I ended up doing is, um, like I tried everything I could think of to get me through that 90 minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me. It sounds like the stuff that nightmares are made out of. Exactly. Exactly. This is, I think, every patient's nightmare when they know they have to go under a general, you know, everybody worries about, will I wake up? Will I feel pain? You know, and um, I know what it's like to have that actually happen. And so in, in the middle of all this, I, like I said, I didn't think I was going to live through it. I, I just didn't see how I could make it. And so I thought about my kids. Uh, I thought about my husband. And um, I worried because I thought, you know, if I die, they're never going to, going to know what my last few hours were like and the, the pain and the agony and almost torture of what I went through. And so I resigned myself to that and I said my mental goodbyes to my husband, Brian, and our two kids and our son-in-law. And um, it was hard. And I, I am of Christian faith. So I asked God to please take me home because I just can't do this anymore. And um, I wanted to die. I wanted to escape the agony. But I didn't die. And when it finally ended and I realized okay the surgery's over I made it it was it was such a relief in a way and yet there was still the pain and then all of a sudden I noticed that I could move my tongue a little bit and I thought oh the paralytic is wearing off and so I'm still 
in a heightened state of panic, even when I knew the surgery was over, because my brain was struggling to understand and process everything that had just happened to me. And so I started to wiggle the, the breathing tube in my throat and my mouth to try and get someone's attention. And so as I did that, uh, they did notice. The surgeon had already left at this point because he was done his job. And uh, the anesthesiologist noticed that I was playing with or wiggling the breathing tube in my mouth. And so I suppose he must have thought that the paralytic had worn off more than what it really had. And so what he did is he simply removed the tube. And the problem was though, even though I could wiggle my tongue, I couldn't do anything else. And so I was left without any means to breathe. And then I knew I was once again in serious trouble. And I thought, there's no way I'm gonna make this because I was literally suffocating on the table. And I was fully and completely aware of what was happening. And so I had the nurse on one side watching me at this point, and she's yelling at me, breathe, Donna, breathe, Donna, breathe, breathe. And I thought, I can't. I just can't. I could not take a breath. And this went on for a little bit. And the next thing I remember is something quite amazing happening. I had an out-of-body experience. And again, words fail me when, when I try to describe how that felt for me. It, it was as though I, I left my body, but I was still nearby. I could hear the sounds in the OR. I could hear the nurses and the anesthesiologist working, doing whatever they were doing, trying to get me to breathe. But yet I was kind of further away. Um, I didn't see anything. I didn't feel or... No, I shouldn't say I didn't feel anything. I didn't, I couldn't see anything, but I knew I wasn't alone in this place I went to. It wasn't heaven, but it wasn't earth either. It was like it was somewhere in between. And I knew immediately that there was a divine presence with me and that it was, it was God. He was with me. And suddenly I didn't feel the fear. I wasn't afraid. Uh, the fear left. It was... The pain was gone, it was warm, and I felt safe. I felt protected. And it always makes me smile when I think about this part because it was the most incredible feeling I have ever had. And I knew at that point, I'm gonna be okay. Whether I lived or whether I died, I knew I would be okay because I knew who was with me. And so I prayed as I had throughout the entire surgery to, to try and occupy my mind. And so I prayed and I asked, I said, you know, I can't do this anymore, please take me home. And then I heard a voice and this voice said to me, you're gonna be okay. Whatever happens, you're gonna be okay. And that was my reassurance that at that point, it didn't matter if I lived or if I died. I was, I knew I was going to be okay. And those words are very, very special to me this day. Um, I get very emotional when I think about that. It was very special. <clears throat> and then just as quickly as I had left my body, I returned. And the, the sounds of the OR became louder again. And I could hear the nurse yelling at me again to breathe, to wanna breathe. And all of a sudden I heard the anesthesiologist say, bag her, bag her. And so they put a mask on my face and like you see on TV, these big plastic, um, I don't know what to call them. They, they, these plastic bags that they squeeze and then they, they force the air into your lungs kind of thing. Um, I don't, sorry, I don't know the technical terminology. Yeah, but. I know what you mean. Yeah, they did that. <clears throat> and immediately I felt just this huge relief because 
um, not being able to, to breathe and get that oxygen, my, it felt like my lungs were on fire and they were ready to burst. And it was such a, such a relief when they did that. And it was like, okay. And uh, then again, I felt the anesthesiologist give me something in the IV and uh, it turned, it was a reversal for the paralytic. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and a few minutes later, I was able to start moving my head. And so then what I ended up doing is throwing kind of throwing my head from side to side like that again to get their attention. I couldn't speak at this point yet, but this is what I was trying to do. Like, just please, 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 please notice me. And uh, one of the nurses asked, she said, why is she doing that? Is she having a reaction or something? And the anesthesiologist says, I don't know. And so a few seconds went on again. And then I all of a sudden I realized, hey, I, I can move more and more. And so my first words when I was able to speak were, I was awake. I felt him cut me. And I remember so clearly there were the two OR nurses and the anesthesiologist in the room with me. And when I said this, uh, the look on their faces was just, I think they were in shock actually when they heard this because they just looked at each other with this expression on their face that I, I can't quite describe. And it was like, oh boy, did she just say what I think she said, you know, kind of thing. And so I said it again, and I said, I was awake, I felt him cutting me, I felt this, I felt the pain, I felt the incision, I heard everything, I can, you know, I can tell you what they said in the OR, I heard them, you know, you, the surgeon asked you to turn the lights off and then back on again, and I could tell you what he said as he explored my, my abdomen, and throughout this whole time, all the nurses, or the, both the nurses and the anesthesiologist didn't say a word. And so when I began to kind of look at each face individually, I, I knew that they were not going to talk. It was, you know, you could see that, what I call the wall of silence. You could just see it go up and they were on guard and it was like this and we're not saying a word. We're not going to, we're just, this is not happening kind of thing. And so I started calling for my husband and I said, please go get Brian. I need him. I need him now and uh, finally after repeating this many many times they said to me well you know you're you can see him in recovery which of course I knew I knew he couldn't come into the OR I mean that's it's not done but yet at the same time I needed him so badly and so after however long they took me into the recovery room and uh, they went and got Brian for me and as soon as he walked in I I was still crying. I was quite hysterical at the time. And he walked in and he said, what's wrong? And I said, I was awake. I felt him cut me. And I started to tell Brian a few of the things that had happened. And he turned to the nurse and he said, we want to speak to that anesthesiologist and we want to speak to him right now. And she says, well, I think he already left the hospital. And Brian says, I don't care. You go find him and you bring him back. We need to talk to him. And so after, I don't know how many minutes it was, the anesthesiologist walked into my room. He had a few papers in his hand and there was uh, kind of a, uh, one of these portable tables that they have in, in hospitals. It was probably about six feet away from my bed. And he walked up to that table and he just sort of shuffled the papers in his hand. And he looked down at them. He would not make eye contact with me or with Brian. And uh, he just stood there. And so I started talking and I, you know, I repeated again what I had said to him in the operating room. I said, I was awake. I felt the surgeon cut me. I heard everything. I felt everything. And again, I'm hysterical at this point and um, when I finished saying what I needed to say to him again he he would not make eye contact all he did was say exactly three words to me he shrugged his shoulders and he said it happens sometimes and then he turned and he walked out of the out of the recovery room wow and yeah and I 
I think Brian and I, I mean, I know I was in shock, but I think Brian was also in shock because he, here was me telling this story that is like you say, every patient's nightmare. And that was the reaction I got. There was no, I'm sorry. There was no, you know, questioning me about any of it. It was simply, it happens sometimes with a shrug of the shoulders and he was gone. I know from counseling that invalidated trauma only deepens trauma. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of times this is what's referred to as second harm, right? It's the harm after the harm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's just as traumatizing as the initial trauma itself. It was, was awful. I, I felt like I didn't matter. Like what had just happened to me was no big deal to him. And so then Brian asked uh, the nurse, he says, please go get the surgeon. We want to talk to him. And so she, she went and got the surgeon. He came into the room and he had a slightly different, um, well, I shouldn't say slightly, but he had a different reaction. I told him the same things that I had just told the anesthesiologist. And he grabbed my hand with both of his hands and he held my hand tight. And as I spoke, he, he had tears in his eyes. And he said to me, I am so sorry this happened. He said, we will get you the help that you're going to need because you will need help to get through this. And he said, we will do an investigation. We will find out what happened. And so that was that was much more of a reaction that I needed, that I expected. And after he left, the nurse that was taking care of me, again, did not speak to me other than only medical things that she had to tell me. She didn't uh, offer me any words of comfort. There was no you know, pat on the hand, there was no pat on the shoulder, there was no comforting touch, no kind words. She did her job, and that was it. And took care of my physical needs, but that was it. And so we left the hospital after a while, as soon as I was able to, and uh, got into the vehicle. And I said to Brian, you know, just get me out of this place. I never, ever, ever want to come back here again. So we went home that day, um, that same night, the nightmare started, uh, the next day, the surgeon called me and asked how I was doing. And, uh, he called me a couple of times after that. I spoke to him a few times in the next upcoming weeks. The, the RHA or the, the regional health authority at that time was notified. And I was in therapy two weeks later. I don't know who arranged it. I, I, to this, this day, I have no clue. Um, I don't care, <laughs> but they got me in. And two weeks later, I was seeing a counselor who diagnosed me with complex PTSD on the spot. So there was no doubt that I was, you know, severely traumatized. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can't imagine anybody who wouldn't be traumatized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was awful. Yeah, I'm, it's, it's very difficult to listen to. Mm -hmm. um, so I can only imagine, and it's like, yeah, it's just in, unimaginable what you went mm -hmm. through, actually. Yeah. And so what's happened since then? Oh, a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, a lot. Um, three weeks after this happened, I was asked to do an interview for my, my health region and they made a huge mistake and they know it now. At the time, they never thought about it much, but they called me and they asked if I could uh, come in for an interview. They wanted to, you know, as part of their investigation, they wanted to find out more details from me as to, you know, what, what happened, you know, what, what I felt, what I heard, everything, you know, they just needed more information. But what they asked me to do was they asked me to come back to the hospital where this happened. And that's where they arranged the meeting. 
And at the time as a patient, I didn't even know I had a choice because I wasn't given a choice. I was just told, this is where we're going to have this meeting. And, you know, the time we were able to have a say in, in time and stuff, but uh, location was not a consideration at all. And as we were driving, we got nearer and nearer to the, the hospital. And I said to Brian, you know, I just, I don't want to go in there. I don't want to go in there. I, because I know the layout of the hospital. And I know that this meeting is being held right when you walk in the door, which is just, just a little ways down the hall from the operating room. And I said, how can I walk back into that place? And why are they making me do this? Why are they making me walk into the same place where the trauma happened? But they, they didn't understand it from that point of view. They just said, well, that's where it happened. That's where we always do our interviews. Then if there's a problem, then we, we go to the facility where it happened. And I mean, many years later, you know, I said to them, that was probably one of the worst things you could have done is choose a location because I said like that, because it was at your convenience. It wasn't at the patient's, um, you weren't taking into consideration the needs of the patient. It's like and, the last place that it should have right. been happening. Yes. They don't do that anymore. They have changed the way they do things because of my input and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, so that happened three weeks after the incident happened. And so then after that, we went home and we didn't hear from the RHA at all. We didn't hear anything. And so life continued. And I went back to work. It was a distraction for me. Um, I probably shouldn't have, but a week later I was back at work. And it, for me, it was just a sense of normalcy. I needed something normal to, to fill my days because my brain was just constantly rehashing what had all happened and how I felt and the agony and the fear and all that kind of stuff. So three months later, I was actually scheduled for a, a hysterectomy. So that was the outcome of this surgery. They realized I needed a hysterectomy. And so the entire time going through this first couple of months, I knew I was back in the OR in three months time. So try and process everything that just happened with the thought of knowing that I've got to go back into the OR at the end of May. And so in the beginning of May, I believe it was, having not heard anything more from, from the health authority, I contacted the VP of medical services and I called him up and I said, you know, I need to talk. I, I, I just, I need to talk about this. And, um, he said, you know, I, I, uh, I said, do you know who I am? This is my name. And he says, yes, I know who you are. I know your case. And so we talked for a while and he said, how are you doing? And I said, not good, not good at all. And so that was my first connection with the RHA, but it was me, the patient taking the initiative to contact them. They basically did their interview and I didn't hear any more from them. And so we sort of established a relationship with the VP of medical services. And um, I was supposed to contact these ladies that did the interview if I had questions. Well, every time I had a question, it was, uh, I got the runaround basically, well, I'll have to check, I'll have to check. And I knew what they were doing. They had to check to see if they were allowed to answer my question. Can we release this information to this patient? And so it didn't take me long to bypass them. And I went straight to the VP medical and I said, you know, forget them. If I had a question, I asked him. And as time went on and stuff, I, I was able to get some information, but there was so many things that went wrong just so many, many things. And so I went into my next surgery, very distrustful. This is at the same hospital? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I will 
never go back to that hospital again. No. This next one was done at uh, Health Sciences in Winnipeg. And so I went there and they had to do an awful lot of talking to get me to even remotely have like this much trust in, in the OR team. I knew I didn't have a choice. I knew um, I had to go through with that surgery. There was no option for me but to, but they gave me a spinal instead of a general anesthetic for it. And so they also gave me something that made me sleep through it. But I knew if I woke up, I could move my arms, I'd be able to talk to them. And so that was the only way they could convince me that I would be safe. I did wake up halfway through the surgery and I turned and I looked at the um, anesthesiologist and I said, I'm just checking to see if you're here. Because oh I, <laughs> I had threatened to tie him to my bed. <laughs> <laughs> and he said I'm right here I'm right here and I said okay I'm safe and I fell back asleep that surgery went really really well and so as time continued uh, we had been told that we would get some sort of report uh, this report never came and no matter what we did, no matter what we, who we asked, we couldn't get a copy of this so-called report. And so as we, my husband, Brian, did a lot of research into anesthesia awareness at this time, he did a lot of research into what are the standards of care, um, those kinds of things. He did a lot of work. And we found out pretty quickly that an anesthesiologist is never supposed to leave the OR when they have an anesthetized patient. There is always, always, always supposed to be someone there watching over the patient. And when you think about it, it's common sense, right? But when you go in as a patient, those are not things you think of. You take for granted that they're gonna be there to do their jobs and take care of you. Well, that didn't, doesn't, and it didn't always or happen. It didn't happen and it doesn't always happen. And so we found out that when something like this happens, it's called a critical incident and a report is drawn up and sent to Manitoba Health. And so we asked for a copy of this report and we asked for it and asked for it and asked for it and we were, given the runaround. Nobody knew about this report. Finally, after many, many months of trying to, to find a copy of this report, we were told that, well, it wasn't labeled a critical incident because it was I, the patient, who had reported the error. And they said, when that happens, it's labeled a complaint. When the staff catches an error or a near miss, then it's labeled a critical incident. And so they said there was never a critical report filed, a critical incident report filed, because it was me, the patient, who had made them aware that this had happened. And I said, that is absolutely ridiculous. How could you not label something like this a critical incident? And so to, there is no critical incident report for what happened to me because of how the system is set up. The system is set up. It's set up to help providers. It's set up to assist them, but there's no protection for the patient. And so we said, well, is there not an internal report? Well, yes, there is. And I said, well, then give me a copy of that. And so they said, well, they had come up with a report that had some recommendations. I said, I need to see that report. Well, it was quite a chore to try and find that report. And again, I was given the runaround. So finally, we somehow made it in to see the Minister of Health and meet with her. Her name was Teresa Oswald at that time. That was who was our Minister of Health. And to get in to see the ministers of health is not an easy task. But somehow it worked out. And we went into her office. We sat down with her. And she was the most wonderful, understanding, 
woman ever. Like she just, she sat there with tears in her eyes as I told her what had happened to me. And she said, we will get you a copy of this report that, or a report that you're looking for with the recommendations. And so I think it was probably about two, three weeks later, I had the report in my hand. And so she got behind it and she went to the health authority and said, you got to get this patient the report. But the report was something else. It was one and a half pages. It had exactly three bullet points on it, recommendations that they had come up with for ways to improve things so that maybe this wouldn't happen again. And I looked at the report and I cried when I read it. It was so disappointing because nowhere did it acknowledge what had happened to me. Nowhere did they admit that they had made a mistake. It was very um, vague, I guess is a good word. And so we asked again to meet with uh, the VP of medical services, as well as the CEO of the hospital where this happened. And I took that report with me. And I said, this is what you came up with? Three lousy recommendations. And I took the report and I threw it on the desk in front of him. And I said, you have to do better. You have to do better. Uh, one of the things that they'd come up with, with was reorganizing the, the cart where they keep all their medication in the OR, reorganizing that. And I said, who gives a rip about organizing your cart? That had nothing to do with what happened to me. And if it did, why? Why did that have something to do? I said, I want to know, was there you know, a problem with the, the anesthetic gas? Were, were, were you out of product? Like, was the valve not working? Did he forget to turn it on? That's what I want to know. I don't care about your, your cart in the OR. And then they said, well, there were three more recommendations on there, but they thought that those would not be of interest to me, so they didn't bother sending me those. And I, wanna, I said to them, I want to see the full recommendations. And so they sent me, you know, because they knew I had the Minister of Health behind me. So they finally sent me the other three recommendations and it was a joke. It was an absolute joke. I said, this is what you learned? This is all you learned? Like, it's ludicrous. It's ridiculous. It's it was an absolute joke and a shame, a crying shame that they didn't learn any more from what happened to me than that. And I said, this isn't right. And so then I found out that they had actually sent an internal report to Manitoba Health. And I have tried for many, many years to get a copy of that report, but our governments create legislation, and I know Manitoba is not the only province, there are other provinces that have this as well, that protects providers. So when things like this happen, they encourage providers to come forward and offer them protection, basically what they call the Whistleblower Act, that if you tell us, you know, I saw Dr. So-and-so leaving the OR on numerous occasions, and I knew this was happening, but um, I didn't do anything about it. They're not gonna get into trouble for it. That is what this legislation protects. So this, this report that was sent to Manitoba Health, um, I've requested it many, many times. I've approached Manitoba Health themselves. I've approached the VP of Medical Services in our region, the CEO. I have appealed to the Minister of Health on more than one occasion. And all of them say legislation does not um, allow you access to that report. It's internal. So you're not privy to that information. So 11 years later, I still do not know for sure why this happened. And I will never know unless legislation changes. It's awful.
it's it's wrong it's not a just world no no so they know what happened but they won't tell me and it makes anybody's heard your story it makes them wonder how often is this happening how often has this happened since it happened to you exactly exactly so you've taken this horrible experience and you've done some advocacy work mm -hmm. tell me about that uh i knew early on that i needed to do something with this i i didn't know how else to to deal with it and so i started by sharing my story uh, with whoever would listen basically and um, i started in the region i told the, the vp medical i told our ceo i said you know i need to tell my story i need people to know what happened to me and so we also got uh, involved with uh, the canadian patient safety institute or cpsi and uh, there's a branch of the canadian patient safety institute called patients for patient safety canada and it is a group of patients like me who have been harmed by the medical system or who have had a loved one harmed so there are patients who have been uh, either directly harmed themselves or someone very close to them and so yeah so we got involved with the canadian patient safety institute as well as uh, patients for patient safety canada and there i found a group of people who were in similar situations as me the harm is different for each of us individually many of them has lo have lost children um, spouses parents that kind of thing so but the common denominator is that we've all been harmed by the system and we've all got this deep desire to make things better to change the system and so through them uh, through my health region i started advocating and you know making people aware of what happened and sharing my story i also began telling my story in um, church settings where I shared my story of faith and how God has brought me through this and been there to help me with this and, and that kind of thing. So that sort of started the whole ball rolling. As time went on, my health region became um, less interested, I guess, in sharing my story in the region. And I think it was because they were realizing that there were many, many people who were interested in this kind of thing. And I, I sometimes wonder if they were worried about the exposure this would bring. And, you know, because I don't say where it happened. I don't say the names of who was involved. I never share that because to me that takes away from what actually happened. And I, I'm not here to point fingers at anyone. I'm just here to share what happened. And so as time went on and stuff, we, um, together with the Canadian Patient In Safety Institute, made a video and uh, used that video. And I gave that to my health region. And I said, here, use this for educational purposes. Use this to teach your staff about disclosure, what to do, what not to do, how to talk to a patient, what to say, um, things that are important to the patient when you do critical incident interviews or any type of interviews, you know, location. Um, make sure that you do these interviews when it's convenient for the patient. You go to them. You don't make them come to you. You guys get paid for your time. We don't get paid for our time to come to, you know, drive 45 minutes to this hospital and sit down and, and have to take time off work to do an interview for you you make sure that you come and you cater to the patient you make them feel comfortable you make them feel safe those kinds of things you know and uh, as far as i'm aware it they they are still using my video in the region 
And, you know, and from there, it just kind of grew. And uh, I became uh, very interested in sharing my story beyond the region. And so what I did one day is I was playing on the internet and just Googling um, University of Manitoba. And so I went to their anesthesiology department and I wanted a list of the faculty members at the U of M. And when I went to the anesthesiology department, I got like this long list of names and email addresses and stuff. And I kind of looked through them a little bit and I went, oh, straight to the top, head of anesthesia. I'm going to contact him and see, talk to him. And so I sent him an email, told him a little bit of my story. And uh, he responded almost immediately. And knowing how busy he is now, <laughs> I'm amazed that I got that response so quickly. And he said, I need to talk to you. And so we chatted on the phone and uh, I got involved with speaking to the anesthesiology residents or students that are studying at uh, the University of Manitoba through the Health Sciences Center. And so Dr. Jacobson is his name. He and I became very, very good friends. And um, so I, I came back many years in a row to speak to his med students and um, he has now moved on from the head of anesthesiology and stuff so now he lectures all over the world on anesthesiology and patient safety and this last year uh, he was invited to the University of Ottawa and so he took me with him and uh, we did a presentation there together and uh, he was also asked to speak at McGill University in Montreal in um, I believe it was October and so he had uh, told the, the people at McGill, he said, sure, I'll come, but uh, I'm bringing a patient with me. And so we traveled to Montreal together and did a presentation there, which was uh, very powerful and uh, I think very moving for our audience. And so, um, yeah, so I've gotten into doing that with him. Um, next, in 2020, I'm doing uh, another presentation with him in BC at a national anesthesiology conference and uh, I also contacted uh, Red River Community College in Winnipeg a number of years ago and I said um, you have a nursing program you run and they said yep and I said I would really like to come and share my story with your nursing students I said I, I really feel that there's so much that they could learn from this you know again the what not to do what to do how to talk to a patient, you know, what things patients are looking for when things go wrong, um, those kinds of things. And so I have, uh, I went there the first time and immediately was asked to return and uh, will be returning actually in April now this year again. So it's been busy. It's been really busy, but you know, it's, uh, it's very healing for me to do this kind of work. It's very empowering. And, um, it's basically the only way I know to make something good come out of a horrible, horrible situation. Yeah, yeah, I can really uh, get a sense for the meaning that you're creating out of this horrible mm -hmm. event in your life. And yeah. that uh, cliche of making lemonade out of lemons. Yes, yeah. Although exactly. that seems very mild compared to <laughs> <laughs> the trauma you experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so not you know, quite the I, right analogy, but yeah. <laughs> no, but I know I know exactly what you mean. And you know, it's been awesome. My my husband Brian, he's just been such a solid solid support for me throughout the years. Um if not for him, I I probably wouldn't be here anymore because I've gone through some very very dark times. Uh I had to quit working 2 years after this happened. I was able to hang on for two years. And uh, then I, I was closely monitored by my family doctor during this entire time. And uh, one day he said to me, you know, he said, this is, you, you just, you need to take some time and heal. He said, you've managed to distract yourself for almost two years. But he says that you need to deal with that pain inside. And uh, he was right and I knew he was right but somehow for me to and maybe it was not the right way of thinking but that's just how my brain was working at the time it was kind of like 
if I go on medical leave, I'm giving in to the PTSD and I can't let it win. I cannot let it win. But ultimately, I didn't have a choice. It just got to the point where, you know, my mental health was much more important. And I was constantly and still am having flashbacks, nightmares, problems with my short term memory. Um, you know, I can be in mid conversation, like you and I are chatting right now. And uh, all of a sudden, I'll just totally lose my train of thought. And I'll be standing there with this, you know, deer in the headlights look thinking, what were we just talking about? I have no clue. It happened to me just yesterday again, where I totally blank. And I have no recall of the last few minutes of conversation. It's gone. It's just gone. And so even all these years after, uh, I still struggle with this every single day. And my doctor was very, very right in putting me on medical leave because I, I could not continue. I just could not. It, it strikes me that you, uh, when you say that uh, initially for those first few years, you're resistant to leave work because that would be giving into the PTSD. Um, mm -hmm. And it sounds like you've come to realize that you had to leave work otherwise PTSD would have won. Yes. Yes. But at the time I didn't see it that way. You know, yeah. it was, I was surviving. I mm -hmm. wasn't living. I was surviving. And um, <clears throat> just before I left work, then uh, there was an instance where um, something stressful happened. And uh, the, that evening, I went into our bedroom and I was crying. And Brian came into the room and he's, he asked me, he says, what's wrong? And I said to him, I don't want to live anymore. It was just too much. And uh, I asked him to hide my medication on me. And I said, I need you to put it somewhere where I can't find it tonight. And I could tell by the look on his face, he didn't know quite what to think. It was hard for him to hear that, um, but I knew I wanted that medication. I knew I had enough to do the job. I Escape knew I had pain. enough. Yes, I wanted the pain to end. And I said, you know, I'm gonna walk out of here, but I want you to hide it so I can't find it tonight. And that for me was probably the point at which I realized uh, I can't work any longer. I need to take care of me. And he did that for me. And that was probably the darkest day I've had since all of this happened. I still, uh, it's better now, but I still, I've gone through periods where I have really struggled with suicidal thoughts. Uh, on days when it's really, really hard, um, you just feel like giving up because um, I didn't ask for this to happen. Um, it's not my fault it happened. It's the fault of a very broken medical system. And it was, it was wonderful timing, but about three weeks after this happened, um, our first granddaughter was born. And our grandkids, our children and our grandchildren are just, they're my sunshine, you know? And uh, when she came along the first one, it was just, uh, 
it was such an answer to prayer because it gave me something to focus on and not that not that my husband and children weren't something to focus on but somehow a baby just um it changes your world you know and uh they're pretty special little people now we have three of them and uh it's life is good life yeah, that, is really good that's good to hear so as we know there you're not alone in experiencing medical error and trauma right. from the medical error and the subsequent treatment from the system the hospitals yes uh, so the f other people who are struggling with PTSD because of medical error, what would you say that they need to hear or what would you suggest they do to help themselves? Talk about it. Talk about it. Talk about it. And then talk about it some more. The very first therapist I had gave me that piece of advice. He said, Donna, you're going to need to talk about it. Don't bottle it up inside. Uh, he said, talk about it. Um, you're going to run into things where family, friends don't want to hear about it anymore. They're going to turn their back. They're going to walk away from you. They're going to hurt you because they're, they're going to get tired of hearing about it. But he said, don't let that stop you. Find someone else who will listen. Talk to the medical people. Fight for change in the medical system. Be vocal, as hard as it is. And, you know, there will be times when you feel like you're spinning your wheels. But he said, talk about it and talk about it some more. And over the years, that has been the best piece of advice I've ever received. Because I took that to heart. And I thought, you know, I'm going to do that. And it's exactly as he said, you know, family members don't always understand. They, I, you know, friends don't always understand. Co-workers don't always understand. Sometimes they don't understand at all. And I've heard many mean comments. Uh, some of them said to my face, you know, you're very selfish for going on medical leave you are um you're faking it you're just making this up um you know you look fine why is it that you can't work because to look at me you look fine physically and i said well you know um it's interesting that you say that because i said medical harm isn't just always physical there's a lot of mental medical harm that goes on as well and i said people don't understand that they don't always want to understand that because we are now, you know, just gaining momentum into mental health and, you know, getting people to understand that this is a very real thing and that mental health is so very important. And so my advice to people is just to talk about it and, you know, whoever will listen, spread the word, you know, spread the message that patient safety is so important and we need to educate our our medical people the administrators the the pr providers the nurses the docs everybody we need to let them know how devastating medical harm can be and how living with ptsd isn't it's not fun and games it's a very real and very serious thing and we hear so many people, you know, soldiers that come back from war and the statistics when it comes to suicide are just staggering. And it's a sad, sad reality. But, you know, the more we educate, the more we talk to people and share our stories, the more people can learn. And that is something that I really take to heart. You know, and as hard as it is, as many times as you're going to, you know, some days you beat your head, you feel like you're beating your head against the wall and, you know, nobody's listening. Nobody's, nobody's getting it and stuff. But, you know, what do you, 
What do you tell yourselves on those days when you feel like you're beating your head against the wall with the advocacy stuff? <laughs> what do I tell myself about that? Hmm. There's days when I give up. Um, I had an experience just this past year where I walked away from some advocacy work because I felt like the people were turning their backs on me. I felt betrayed. I felt abandoned. I have cried many, many tears over this situation. Um, and so I thought to myself, well, you know, they always say when one door closes, another door opens. And so I thought maybe I've done everything I can do in that situation, in that environment. Maybe it's time to move on to something else. And so I'm still working at coming to terms with that loss because I felt that I had some very close friends in that environment and I felt very betrayed when they suddenly decided that, well, they couldn't help me anymore. They couldn't, uh, they didn't know how to support me anymore and chose to just sort of abandon me basically. And so I decided, you know, I might walk away from that situation, but I told them to, <clears throat> excuse me, just before I walked away, I said, I will not be silenced. You may not want to, to hear what I have to say, and you may not be open to doing anything about it, but I will not be silenced. I will continue to share my story. And if you don't like it, deal with it. <laughs> you know, it's, but I have to do what's right for me. And um, I will not hide behind the culture of silence. I will not allow their behavior and their, their, what I call betrayals to you know, walk me away somewhere and <laughs> silence me. I won't let it happen. You're a fighter. Not, yeah. Some days, yes. Some days I sit and allow myself to feel a little sorry for myself and I have my cry <laughs> and then we carry on. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not an easy road by any means. Never has been and I don't see it ending anytime soon. I've been in therapy since it happened and I am going on a regular basis and I do not see an end in sight. This is my life because of medical error. Because someone made some poor choices and um, I'm the one who has to pay the price. Yeah. You're the one who has to reinvent yourself after this tragedy yes. yes something you were not wanting expecting not at all not it's at all. the uh, most difficult type of change that we have to deal with is the unwanted unexpected traumatic change yes absolutely. Uh, I, I i must say you're you're an inspiration in that you know, you're not um having it bring you down and that you're taking it and making meaning out of it and creating a safer, safer environment for lots and lots of people. And, and that is what keeps me going. You know, the, the fact that there are people who are willing to listen. There are people who want to change. There are people who are good and kind and have compassion and empathy for patients. Not, not everyone is uh, arrogant and narcissistic, I guess, or, you know, whatever. But uh, there are good people. And um, it's important that we focus on those. And, you know, those are the people who can make change happen. You know, the ones who are willing to listen to the patients and work with them and learn from these horrific mistakes, you know, and uh, I don't for a minute believe that anybody woke up that day and said, oh, you know, Donna's coming into the OR today. She's, it's a, you know, an emergency case. Uh, we're going to harm her today. I don't believe that for a minute. Nobody does that. But they did allow things to happen. 
they allowed bad behaviors because the surgeon did say to us um, that very day in the recovery room, he said, I hate it when he leads the OR, as in the anesthesiologist, because it puts more pressure on me to monitor the patient as I'm operating. <clears throat> so this wasn't the first time it had happened. And they knew it was happening, and they knew that it goes against the standards of care. And yet they didn't do anything about it. They allowed it to continue until I got hurt. And it shouldn't be that way. It, you, they shouldn't wait until there's harm before they make changes that could potentially harm a patient. They need to make those changes before the harm happens. It, it really strikes me with your story that it, it's not so much the individuals as the system that that's broken. Yes. Sure, the individuals make errors, but the system allows those errors to occur and sustains them to a certain extent by this um, legislation that Absolutely. really impedes uh uh, transparency right right yeah because imagine how hard it is for for someone like me to go back into the operating room and I've had a few surgeries since this happened like I've had you know rotator cuff surgeries on both shoulders I've had uh, a surgery on my foot um, and a couple other ones where I've needed to be under a general anesthetic so imagine how hard it is for someone like me to walk back into that OR, knowing what has happened in the past, and not that specific OR, but I just mean a OR, an OR, and to have to trust the very people in the system that hurt you. You know, not, not exactly the same people that hurt me, but to have to trust the same, sorry, to trust people in the same positions as the ones that that initiated the harm. So it's almost, it's courage. almost impossible. Yes, yeah, it it's takes a tremendous amount of courage. To overcome that amount of fear, and that fear is based on a real experience. It's not yes. a, it's not a made up overblown theoretical mm -hmm. fear, it's a, a factual fear. Uh -huh. Lived experience. Very much so, yeah. very much so, you know, and it, I look at the nurses and I look at the docs and stuff like that, that I've had since then, and they're good people. They're, they really are. They, they want to help the majority of them, but there's always the few apples in the basket, right? That, that think, oh, the rules don't apply to them. It's okay. The patient is, is fine. They're stable. I can walk out and grab a coffee. No, you can't. Um, you can't do that. Yeah. We're you not just, making widgets. We're dealing with yes. people's lives. You're dealing with people's lives. And, you know, I truly believe that I nearly died on the table that day. And um, the out-of-body experience just confirms that for me. And so what would have happened if I had died? Would they ever have known that I had been awake through the whole thing? No. No and things would have continued, you know? So maybe there's a reason that I, I didn't die that day. Maybe it was to, you know, to spread my story and to share it and to make people aware that this kind of thing happens. There are, there are bad behaviors, you know? And it's so important for providers to, to listen to their patients and to hear what they, I mean, really take to heart what it is they're telling you and stuff, and, and a friend of mine um, uh, made a comment the other day, and I'm gonna steal it from her <laughs> a little bit because it was so true. She said, she had asked the question, who are the real experts in medicine? It's not the doctors, it's not the nurses, it's the patients. They are the experts in their own care. And it is so true, it is so true. Absolutely. And so, yeah, it's like, you know, we need, the patient gets to get off, they need to get off their knees and the doctors need to get off their pedestals, you know, and we need to meet in the middle and balance 
may, you know, balance things out. It's not the providers here and the patients here. That's how the, the hierarchy has been for many, many years in medicine. You know, and uh, I always say to people too, I says, you know, don't confuse your one hour of training in PTSD with my 11 years of living with it. Right? I'll put, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, what you learned in a classroom or read in a textbook it is a shadow of the lived experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Donna. That was an emotional roller coaster <laughs> to travel your <laughs> experience yeah. with you. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's I, could, I could tell on your expressions too that it affected you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was swallowing yeah. hard a number of times there. Mm hmm. Um, but it's, it's a hard story to listen to. It is. It's a hard story to hear. I know. I'm very aware of that. But I don't sugarcoat it. I tell it like it is because the people need to hear this. You know, this kind of thing happens. It's real. And um, you know, we need to do what we can to to make it stop. Basically, you know, we need Absolutely. to educate people on patient safety. It's so so important and you know we need to engage patients and it's uh yeah i see the patient movement on twitter i see the you know patient engagement movement on facebook and and other social medias and um you know it's gaining momentum and it's awesome to see it's really great to see